court. Um, you want to start off by just introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Nigel Bins. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is it? What, what's your profession? What is it you do? Uh, I do multiple, um, a multitude of things. I'm a sculptor, a portrait sculptor, which is a lot different from someone who just creates images and objects. I specialize in people, uh, and I'm able to capture their essence. So I'm a sculptor at one. I'm a martial artist. I've uh, started training in 1968. I love the martial arts, and I'm also an instructor of the martial arts. And uh, I'm an author, a published author. I've written a couple of books on the martial arts. Um, and then lastly, and not least, I'm a member of the Screen Actors Guild, a stuntman and an actor. Great. Yeah, published author, huh? 1968. So you're pretty much a master at, in the martial arts? Uh, some would consider me a master, right. you know, based on the length of time that I've been involved in the martial arts, yes. And I remember you, last time we spoke, you spoke of... Uh, being the first person to bring the martial arts to Africa? Uh, not quite. I am the first person who documented uh, that the martial arts began in Africa. The origins of the martial arts is Africa. You see, most people think it's Asia, but it's not. And although it's associated with um, Asia, uh, people in Asia, martial arts in Asia, it didn't begin there. Right. It's like all humanity actually began in Africa. Yeah. So if humanity began in Africa, it's you know, kind of logical to think that uh, the fighting sciences may well have evolved in Africa, and they did. And I was the one, the first one, to actually do my research um, over a number of years and uh, wrote the book called Nuba Wrestling, The Original Art. And that proves that the martial arts began in Africa. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, was that a painstaking process? The research it was a labor of love. Yeah. I'm curious by nature. Right. I want to know everything. Right. So <laughs> that's interesting. What is what is what is it that uh, what I would say? I guess not hope to accomplish, but what's like a personal philosophy? That you seem to be well versed in. I mean, I'm looking around at all these sculptors, and you're pretty well versed at sculpting. I can tell, um, and you're well versed in martial arts. Mm -hmm. In the film industry, what is your personal philosophy behind all this? My personal philosophy, Tony, is uh, whatever we do in life should be as easy as breathing. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Right now as we're speaking, you're not thinking about breathing. Yes, do your breathing. You've been breathing all your life, but you're not thinking about it. And that's how we should live our lives. So whatever we do, our personal philosophy, my personal philosophy, is that whatever you do in life, whatever your profession is, should be as easy as breathing. Because if it is, then you're going to continue doing it effortlessly. And if that happens, we have a much more beautiful world because you wake up in the morning and you want to do what you're doing. That's my philosophy. Interesting. How, how did you get to that? How did you get to comparing uh, life to breathing? Well, it's not comparing life to breathing, but it's comparing what we do with our lives. It should be as easy as just breathing. And how I got there, I, I don't know. Um, I just observation. You know, When we're stressed, we, our breathing is you know, tight, we feel anxious and, you know, and that's not how we should live, you know. So obviously what we do in life creates stress or not. And if what you're doing in life doesn't create stress, and it's easy and it's fun, it's as easy as breathing. I like it a lot. Yeah. I like it a lot. Um, what first got you into sculpting? Well, I began sculpting as a child in high school and just, you know, kind of tinkering here and there. I took one art course and I, that was it. But I've always loved art. I've always loved to draw and everything else. Um, sculpting, however, was the next dimension past drawing. I could bring my art uh, into the world in three dimensions, you know. And so I took to it, I liked it, I enjoyed it, and the results were immediate. So I just continued to refine the process and study. I'm, uh, well, I am self-taught. I, I didn't go to school to create the works of art that I've done over the decades, um, but my powers of observation, I miss absolutely nothing. I see and hear almost everything. So with that, I, um, I was very good at sculpting because I didn't miss anything. I observed very closely, and I was able to translate what I saw into the clay. Interesting. Well, it would seem like that would be a skill that would work very well with sculpting. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And film work as well, you know. You know to be a, a filmmaker, a cameraman, you have to be able to see everything and uh, 
capture the essence of what you're looking at and put that together and create a work of art. It's the same thing. It's powers of perception, how we actually see and how well we can observe. Interesting. Um, how did you get started in the film industry? Uh, well, um, I'm a fan of Bruce Lee. I mean, who isn't, right? As a martial artist, who is not a fan of Bruce Lee, right? Everybody is. And it just happened that it was during my time uh, in college, first year in college, that Bruce Lee died. And it was a big shock, you know, around the world. But for me in particular, I've always had that superhero mentality. I grew up on Marvel Comics and all that kind of stuff. So I've always looked at you know, being a role model, a superhero, and all that kind of stuff. I'm the kid who would put on a Batman cape and run around the block yelling Batman, you know, back in the day, right? So um, Bruce Lee became a personal um, uh, hero, and when he passed away, I said, okay, well, I want to do that, you know? I want to fill, not fill those shoes, but I want to step in that role as um, uh, someone in front of the camera doing martial arts and creating some magic. So um, I planned it out that a kid from New Jersey, first year in high school, no money, how am I going to get into the film industry? And that's a long and crazy story, but it's true. So I reasoned that if I left school and joined the Air Force, that I can travel. And so I planned it out, four years. I said, okay, my first two years, I want to get stationed in California, not too far from LA, where I could meet all these celebrities and kind of plant the seeds, and I did. I met um, Bruce Lee's wife, Linda Lee, Bruce Lee's son, Brandon, um, the director of Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee's famous film, my dear friend, Robert Klaus, who became a lifelong friend until he passed away. I met all the people that I needed to, because when I was in the Air Force, and I chose the Air Force instead of the Navy or the Marine Corps, because I could sit behind a desk all day and pick up the phone. <laughs> And so for two years, that's what I did, my first two years. Then I reasoned that my second two years, I want to be in Asia, so that when I got out of the military after my four years, I'd be right at the doorsteps of Hong Kong, where they made all these martial arts films. It worked. Uh, the last two years, I was in Okinawa, Japan, made all my contacts. Um, when I got out, after four years now of planning and doing everything right, um, the very day I got out, I was on a plane to Hong Kong. Got to Hong Kong, Golden Harvest Studios, and uh, they said, Nigel, you know, it's a great effort, you know, God bless you, you did, uh, did well, you know. But the truth is, we here in Hong Kong, we don't make a lot of films with black stars, by the way, um, in case you just didn't really kind of realize it. You know, we're Asian and we, we haven't made anything for the American or African American market, so I'm afraid maybe you wasted your time. And I took it in stride, as I always do, and uh, um, I said, well, you know, I know all these people. I, I met um, Bob Klaus, the director of Enter the Dragon. You know, I know all these contacts. And they said, you know, well, if you, if you really are friends with Bob Klaus, why don't you give him a call? Because we're getting ready to make a film with this new Asian sensation. And if you really, you know, if you know him like you say you do, uh, maybe you can ask him to put you on in the film. And so he was trying to call my bluff. He didn't think I knew Bob Klaus. So I got on the phone. I said, hey, Bob, this is Nigel. <laughs> I'm over here in Hong Kong. I'm stuck. You know, they're telling me they don't make films with black people here. You know, uh, do you have anything going on? I hear you making this film. And Bob says, yeah, come on back to the States. Uh, I'm making this movie with this new Asian sensation named Jackie Chan. And maybe I can get you in. So I began my military career at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. After four years, the first movie I was going to work on with Jackie Chan was right back in San Antonio, Texas. And that was how I got in the film industry. As a stuntman with Jackie Chan, sad card, the whole nine yards, bingo. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Wow. I'm, from, I'm born and raised in Austin. Whoa! Yeah, my dad was in the Air Force Reserves. We go up to San Antonio all the time. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and doubling back to your Bruce Lee point, I was, yeah. when you told me your, your breathing philosophy, it reminded me of the be like water. Yeah. It reminded yeah. me of a lot of like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Bruce is water, I'm breathing. <laughs> water and air, right? That's right. Water and oxygen. That's right. <clears throat> so, you... Also, a great story on how 
young people should hear that story about how planning That's right. really works for... It does. Oh man, I can't tell you. Right, so you do all of this, you plan the Air Force, you literally plan your stations for your career post-military. Yes. And it full circle comes back around to San Antonio, Texas, working with Jackie Chan. Yes. How does, how does it evolve from there? Do you just, do you become, do you just, do you just skyrocket from there and just like constant film industry work or, or was it a, a bit of a struggle or, or? In the beginning it was um, constant because on the big brawl I made film, friends with a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Pat Johnson, who later went on to do the fight coordinating for Ninja Turtles, Mortal Kombat, all the top films at that time, martial arts, uh, he became my mentor. And so when he was not able to do the fight coordinating for Karate Kid 2 starring Ralph Macchio, he called me in to assist in a fight scene uh, for that film. So that was my first gig uh, doing fight coordinating. But up to that point, Bob Klaus had been, God bless him, the, the, the greatest friend that I ever had in the film business because everything that he worked on, he called me to work on. And he was building me up to get to that point where I would eventually have had my first film. But unfortunately, I had kidney problems and passed away. That stopped my work in the film industry. Only because I'd been sheltered by people like Pat Johnson and Bob Klaus while I was making uh, films like Force 5, uh, Karate Kid 2, and then the last film I worked on with Bob, uh, two films, was China O'Brien 1 and 2. And for those films, I acted in it, but mostly I was a fight coordinator for both of those films. So I was being prepared and groomed over the years, and then Bob died, and it was like, okay, I've got no contacts, you know. And um, uh, that's what kind of slowed me down. I did one work after that with um, uh, Imposter, Gary Sinise. I did some stunt work there. But I just wasn't really ready yet to go back out beating the bushes and making contacts. Instead, I kind of... Uh, took a detour towards um, classes in acting because it's been known for me for a long time that even if my martial arts skills are great, um, age will make a difference and your acting or lack of acting abilities will make a difference. So Chuck Norris was the first friend that I made in the first two years of my military career and he suggested Estelle Harmon acting workshop that I could use my GI Bill when I got out and I did. Um, but I realized uh, after Bob died that I needed to really pursue acting, the, the craft of acting more than the martial arts. Martial arts I could do with my eyes closed, but um, acting was something that I needed to do. So I've been taking acting classes all the way up to about a year and a half ago. Uh, and of course, simultaneously with my art career, um, I'm still working to juggle it. But I, my passion really was martial arts films. I still have some visions of what I could do there that haven't been done before, uh, literally have not been done before, so I still am pursuing that. Wow. Oh, great. And then how did, uh, how did you segue into sculpting from there? <laughs> well, during my off time of uh, not working on a film, I could have been out just submitting resumes and making contacts and so forth, but instead I took a quiet time and said, okay, well, uh, what else can I do while I'm not working in the film business and waiting for that next call? Which might have been a mistake in one hand, film-wise, but it was a blessing in the other regarding my development uh, as an artist because I continued to hone my skills as an artist. And so one day, I said to myself, okay, if I can create a statue that people would want to buy, um, who would it be? So I went around, I canvassed the neighborhood, I said, okay, um, who would you want to see a statue of? And it was at that time when people said, okay, yeah, um, Malcolm X, let's see one of Malcolm X or Bob Marley. So I created a miniature six-inch figure. My first one was Malcolm X. Put it out there, it did well. Money started to come in. I said, okay, that's good. I did another one, Sojourner Truth. Um, then another one, Bob Marley. So I continued to do a series of them, putting them out there in different gift stores, trade stores, and uh, trade conventions, excuse me. <clears throat> And they were doing well. Uh, so I continued to refine my skills as a sculptor to the point where um, I would have a portfolio and I'd bring that with me wherever I would go. I have a friend by the name of Joshua Thompson. He's a musician. He's done work with a lot of people. I could name them. But uh, before he really made well, he would come out here every summer from New Jersey where we're both uh, working out of, where 
I'm from. And uh, he'd sleep in my living room floor, but we'd get up in the morning and beat the pavement, and he'd have his CDs and, you know, just kind of shop it around, right? This one particular summer, he said, okay, let's go to Quincy Jones's office, which was on Beverly Boulevard at the time. So we got in my car, went to Quincy Jones's office, go up the stairs, Quincy's not there. So, okay, wasted time. So we're going back down the stairs, we look over to our left, and there's an office with all these gold and platinum albums on the wall. So my friend said, back up, let's go in there. So I've got my portfolio, we go into the office and meet a gentleman by the name of Stan Hillis, who is working for a company called Fitzgerald Hartley. And Fitzgerald Hartley makes all these gold and platinum albums for uh, artists and uh, performers. So my friend's talking to Gerald and kind of getting, you know, um, the lay of the land, Stan. Um, Stan Hillis, I'm sorry, is his name. Fitzgerald Hartley is the company. So backing up. He's talking to Stan and uh, getting information about how these albums are created and so forth. And I'm quiet off to the side, you know, just mind my business. This is music, you know, I'm art and film and everything else. But Stan turns to me and said, you know, you're the quiet one over there, just sitting like that with your arms folded. No, what are you, uh, what are you about? And I said, well, I'm an artist. Uh, I said, really? What kind of artist? I said, I'm a sculptor. And uh, then Stan said, yeah, um, can I check out your work? So I said, sure. So he's leafing through my portfolio, and I just happen to have a photograph of a statue that I did of Michael Jackson in clay. It was a bust with his aviator glasses on and everything. And I had it gold-plated, and uh, this was in 1985, and I literally gave that away to Joe Jackson one day. I went up to his office and said, hey, Joe, you know, I really am thankful for you and Catherine bringing Michael into the world, and this is my way of saying thanks here. I made this for, for you, just to thank you for bringing Michael into the world. And Joseph was a little skeptical. He said, okay, nobody does that. I don't care how good you, you're sounding. Nobody just does this and gold plates it. And he goes, you know, what do you got, a gold mine in your backyard, you know? And um, I said, no, this is honest. There's no fine print. I want nothing. I just want to give you this to say thank you. And he said, okay, well, the least I could do is write you a letter to say thank you very much. I've received it. And he did. So when Stan Hillis, um, in 1990, you know, five years later, is leafing through my portfolio, he sees the picture of the statue I created of Michael and the letter from Joseph Jackson, his father. And he turns to me and says, you're not going to believe this. But my office just got a commission from Sony Studios to create an award for Michael Jackson. Do you think you might be interested in this job? I said, well, let me think about it for a second. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, I literally walked into the pages of history. Uh, prior to this, I was working exclusively in clay. This was my first bronze professional fine art statue. Um, Stan really didn't make it easy, though. He said, okay, Nigel, I'm going to challenge you if you're really this good. Here is a silhouette, you know, those black silhouettes with no detail, just a black figure. It was of Michael Jackson in a classic dance pose. But he said he had him in his piece of paper and said, here, make this Michael Jackson. You know, no detail, not even a photograph, right? He said, make this Michael Jackson. I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> so I go home that day, you know, and I start working on it. I work my magic. And um, the sculpting is is to perfection, even to where Michael in the Smooth Criminal video is wearing a white pinstripe suit. So I put pinstripes in my clay statue. I mean, it's that detailed, right? So I um, took it to the foundry, had it made in bronze. It was silver plated. The presentation was perfect because, um, you know, a couple of weeks later, um, I'm sitting on my living room floor and watching TV, and there's Michael Jackson receiving this award from Tommy Mottola at Sony that was in my hands just a few hours earlier. And that was uh, the start of history for me. And just like Jackie Chan, I've always started at the top, whatever it was, with Jackie Chan, with Michael Jackson, you know, and now in rap with Tupac, I've always started at the very top of my, my field. So um, that was how I got started professionally in sculpting. <laughs> so you mentioned Tupac. How did, how did Tupac come across you? Um, just like the Shirley Temple did. 
um, uh, reference, you know, people who know the quality of my work. Um, I have a friend, a childhood friend, uh, by the name of Cedric Knight. And uh, back in the day, back in New Jersey, he was also one of my martial arts students, but dear friend. And uh, over the years, we've reconnected uh, around my Mother of Humanity uh, statue and my project. He carries around a miniature Mother of Humanity in his pocket. And every opportunity he gets to introduce it, he says, hey, I want to tell you about my friend Nigel and about this project he's working on called Mother of Humanity. So this particular day, though, he's a, he's a contractor by trade. And uh, this particular day, he called me and said, hey, I'm in Atlanta. I'm at the place that was formerly the Tupac Amaru Shakur Center that Tupac's mom founded. It was on two acres of land in Stone Mountain, Georgia. He said, I'm here. There's some new owners who purchased the property and the old statue of Tupac that was being, you know, defaced and that didn't look like Tupac was eventually removed, but they want to put a new statue there. And I told them about you. So that's how that commission came about. I contacted them uh, in January of this year, 2017. And um, the owner of the property, Jim Burnett, He's the one that actually commissioned me to start work on this new project of Tupac, which, you know, is probably going to be the best one yet. Interesting. Wow. And how did you, how did you prep for that? How, you, I'm, I'm assuming your prep is, is similar throughout all your projects. Yes. Or you just you study the subject. Yeah. But, you know, I don't really just study the subject. I want to know what they ate for breakfast. I want to know what their favorite colors are. I want to know what their problems are. I study them from the inside because that's where my, my sculpting is created, from inside. The outside is just the finalization of what's inside. So I have to know everything about the, the subject that I'm sculpting to put that into the clay. So hundreds and hundreds of hours of work um, studying photographs, studying videos. Um, I've got all, unless there's some that I haven't seen yet, of uh, Tupac's interviews um, and I've studied them very closely, studied his attitude, studied uh, the inflection in his voice, studied who he really was so that when I create a statue all that comes out in the work. Unlike most artists they will just do the next step which is just to look at photographs and try to model it close to it but no I, I've got to know everything. I've got to know everything about the person that I can uh, to make the work a reality. So that's how I approach my work. Wow. Because I don't want to think that someone else is going to come after me to do another job. You see, the, whole, the only reason why I'm now given this commission, um, which I knew years ago, because the artist who created the first Tupac statue, I knew the quality wasn't there. And I said back then, years ago, that I'm going to get a call. So I was literally waiting for this call from Jim Burnett. I knew I was going to get that call. It was no doubt in my mind. So I said, okay, fine, you know, I was waiting for your call, Jim. When an artist creates a work, unless they want someone else to come and do a work after, they have to do the best possible job. Because I'm not looking for someone else to come and do a better job on Tupac than what I'm doing. It's got to be the best. You essentially, you're creating the definitive yes. Tupac. It's got to be. Yeah. It's got to be the best. I have found in my research of all the statues of Tupac that are currently in existence, and the closest one we would say might be Madame Tussaud's wax figures, because they spend uh, quite a bit on getting their figures right but it wasn't accurate. I can tell you on the Madame Tussauds wax figures of Tupac where the inaccuracies are. And that to me says someone didn't go far enough. So, no, 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 no. If we're going to do it, it's got to be the best. It's got to stand for all time. I don't do work that is temporary. I do work that's designed to last. And if it is, I've got to do my homework. Wow. That's a great... It's almost like, a, for me, from a filmmaker standpoint, that's the, the approach I like to believe I take, and yes. you know, all the great filmmakers take. You know, it's, a, it's essentially uh, all people that are great at their craft, I think, have to take. Yes. Yeah. Oh, man. So, 
You you don't I could be wrong here. You don't strike me as a rap or hip hop person. What? How does? I, see, I think that I think personally that makes for a better. I think you you that probably. Like for me. Um, let's compare this to movies, right? I got the best comic movies that came out, in my opinion, were the Dark Knight and the Batman Begins yeah. series. Yeah. And Christopher Nolan has been known to say that he wasn't really a comic book guy before he made those, and look at how great they came out. And yeah. so I think you're able to yeah. approach it freely and more open. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you do you intentionally look for things that challenge you like that, or no? It, it just just comes to you. Yeah, wow. yeah. I, I don't really. Uh, that's the odd thing about uh, my commissions. I don't go after any commissions really. Maybe I should, <laughs> but um, uh, there are people that I'm interested in, uh, like Stan Lee, for example, a personal friend of mine, and I like what he's done. So the same thing like with Michael Jackson. You know, I admired. These people, Jean-Michel Basquiat, another one, Frida Kahlo, these are statues that I've created. And I admire people who are at the top of their craft and, you know, how did they get there? What made them tick? You know, that to me is fascinating. So uh, that's what I do personally. But if other jobs come to me, um, they come by reference, where reference, like the Shirley Temple, you know. Many artists would have died to have gotten that job to create the only bronze statue of Shirley Temple in existence. And she was actually there for the unveiling. Could you imagine how many sculptors would have just dreamed about that? Or even Michael Jackson, you know? But I'm not really like that. I, I, I just express the art. I'm interested in people. I really am interested in people more than anything else. And I want to know what makes them tick, you know? I want to be able to preserve their stories. So that's, that's the approach I take. Uh, when it comes to, to hip hop, um, uh, I knew very little of Tupac, and I'll be honest with you, and I won't mind saying this because I got a reason for what I'm about to tell you. And nobody listening to this, don't get mad, don't get upset, okay, because I got a reason. There's a method to this madness. Just like I could say four years ago that I was going to join the Air Force to get into the film industry, and it happened, there's a reason why I'm going to tell you this. I've not listened or watched more than probably two Tupac videos music videos. I haven't listened to his music. I can't tell you li any lyrics except maybe California Love. And for that, I'm probably pretty rusty, right? I don't listen to a lot of rap, but I haven't listened to Tupac. Now, that's kind of strange, right? No, it's not. Um, my process is very, very methodical. I really want to get to know somebody. I'm not just superfluous to, ah, oh, yeah, I saw that interview. Oh, no, I didn't see this one. Oh, yes, I read you know, what he said, or I saw this video and I didn't see the other ones. No. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it thoroughly. There is a point in the process of the creation of this monument where this apartment is going to be bumping, my studio is just going to be just bumping, the walls are going to be pulsating with Tupac's music. Because at that height, at seven feet tall, everything's got to go into that piece. So the essence, the vibes, everything. So I will immerse myself in his music. Uh, later on down the line in the process of creating this monument. But right now, I'm sorry to say I don't know much about Tupac's music. But I know him, the man. Do you know all about Tupac? Yes. Yes, I do. Based on his interviews, based on what he had to say out of his own mouth about his own life. And that's why I titled the sculpting piece that I'm doing, uh, Tupac, A Work in Progress. Because of everything that young man was going through, he knew that he was a work in progress, you know, from the early days right up to his death. So, yeah, I know a, a lot. Um, not everything, and I, I stay away from the controversy, the gossips, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not interested in that. Um, but the human being, you know, what he was about, what was important to him is what is important to me. I think you'll find, this is just personal, I think you'll find yourself knowing Tupac so well, personally, I think you'll find yourself not surprised by what he rapped about once you start learning the music. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And I think that'll probably only serve you <laughs> better. That's the plan. That's you, the plan. You have this great story about Shirley Temple and what happened with you creating the, the statue that's sitting on Fox Lot. Do you care to recite that? Yes. Um, I got a call from a friend of mine. Um, we worked on a film together. And uh, he was currently working at Sony Studios. I'm sorry, not Sony. Sorry about that, Mr. Murdoch. Fox Studios. <laughs> he was working at Fox Studios, and uh, uh, he knew I was an artist sculptor. So he gave me a call one day and said, Hey, Nigel, um, how would you like to do this statue of Shirley Temple? Now, the backstory behind that is that um, Shirley Temple and Fox, they were having, you know, their moments of uh, disagreement, perhaps, and negotiations. But as part of the negotiations, they decided that um, uh, they'd like to honor Shirley Temple, this is Fox now, by creating a, a statue in her honor, life-size, and dedicating a child daycare center on the Fox Studio lot in her name, which they did. So I was commissioned to create uh, a life-size Shirley Temple and uh, that was a lot of fun because I didn't know anything about Shirley Temple except her name. And I've never watched one Shirley Temple movie all the way through, but for my research, I had to. And I became immersed in Shirley Temple, uh, her life story, etc., etc. And the statue that I created was from uh, a film called Baby Take a Bow. And um, yeah, a classic Shirley Temple film. The interesting thing about that um, commission goes all the way back to the fact that when Shirley Temple was a child and she made films with a dancer, an African-American dancer, a tap dancer by the name of Bilbo Jangles Robinson, legendary, um, they had to cut the scenes out of the films that they made when they were holding hands and doing a dance routine. Because when those films were shown down south, Southern whites would be offended to see a black man and a white child, white girl holding hands. And so they had to cut those scenes out. But I believe that the universe has a way of doing what's right. You know, I believe wholeheartedly in the powers of the universe, the things that we can't see, because they balance things out. So therefore, the universe said, OK, that was not correct to cut those scenes out and to be offended. So I'm going to correct it. The hands of a black man is going to create this statue of Shirley Temple. So there, you know, and that's how I looked at it. And uh, so I became the one that created this statue of Shirley Temple. And um, I had never met Shirley Temple, but I did meet her at the unveiling. And it was so funny. I invited my mom and uh, a neighbor here uh, to the unveiling. And uh, we were standing on one side of the wall. And Shirley Temple was on the other overlooking where we were. And so uh, all I heard first was, that's Nigel, that's the sculptor. <laughs> and that was my introduction to Shirley Temple. And uh, when I, I met her, she was amazingly one of the most graceful people I've ever met in my life. Uh, Michael Jackson, and by the way, I, I did a couple of awards for Michael. I also bodyguarded him, so with him there was a special spiritual thing happening. But with Shirley Temple, there was a grace and an ease that was definitely universal. She kept what it was in her childhood that made her special and universally loved well into her adult years. Because at the end, at the beginning of our meeting and at the end of the unveiling, you should see the photographs. They express clearly. You know, my, my hand is around her shoulder. We were friends like we'd known each other for years. She knew things about me that she did her research. You know, um, she, <laughs> she said she knew I had pets because I love pets. So she goes, yeah, I, I know you have a cat and you have turtles, uh, but where's your girlfriend? <laughs> and I just had to bust out laughing. <laughs> Because Shirley Temple was just that type of person. She put you at ease regardless. And that's important because it was painfully clear to me and my mom. It bordered on the verge of embarrassment when they unveiled the statue and had Shirley Temple come up and speak, but no reference to me at all. And I was feeling unbelievable that this was actually happening. 
in front of my mom, in front of Shirley Temple, in front of everybody, that the people who were, you know, putting all this together never intended, it seemed, to acknowledge me. It was supposed to be where that, you know, the, the, the work was created, the artists did it, but we're not really going to worry about that too much. Just that we want to please Shirley Temple and Rupert Murdoch was there. Rupert Murdoch was there as well. So if the big boss was there, Shirley Temple was there, but the artist, well, yeah, he's off this side. We won't mention him. All right, Shirley saw that. She saw that. She was on stage looking at me saying, I know what they're trying to do. She saw that. And she made a point to call me back up, to call me up on stage. And I bounded from my seat on top of that stage faster than you could think. Because Shirley was that perceptive. She knew what was going on. And she made it a point to call me up on stage to get my recognition. And so therefore, the photographs of me with Shirley Temple and Rupert Murdoch were only as a result of Shirley Temple. That's the type of person she was. That's the type of person she was. It seems like she, she probably harbored a lot of resentment from those films being edited in the South or something. That was part of it because when I asked her, you know, what statue would you like to see? She said to me that the statue that she wanted was one with her and Bilbo Jangles Robinson. And I promised her, I hope I'll be able to fulfill that promise, but I promised her I'll make one. But the problems that she was going through with Fox was one where, you know, they made this statue of her kind of to appease her. You know, she was battling because of the catalog of her works that Fox was controlling and so forth and so on. So that was part of the negotiation to create a statue. So Fox really probably didn't have the best intentions for Shirley Temple at all. They probably didn't even like her, you know. But she knew all of that. So when she saw me and my mom sitting there and nobody was paying attention, and I'm the sculptor, the first word I heard was her voice saying, there's Nigel, there's the sculptor. So for me to sit there not being received properly in front of my mom, that was hugely disrespectful. And I was getting pissed off by the second. I'm saying, no, you're not going to do the unveiling and close the ceremony and not recognize me in front of my mom who's come all the way from uh, New Jersey. Shirley saw that. She was so perceptive, so aware of everything that she saw that and said, Nigel, you know, come on up. And I can't tell you. I was like that, I was there. Because I know she knew what was going on. So yeah, that's my story with Shirley Temple. That's a great story. Uh, you mentioned Frida Kahlo. I wanted to just say, I just started researching her a little bit because I've been writing some things and, and I, I uh, researched her. I discovered she got in a, she never had any kids and when she was younger. That's right. She was in a horrible, horrible, horrible accident. Yeah. Straight through. Yeah. And there was only, uh, I think there was only from, this is from what I read. There was only one person, there was only one doctor that made that correlation about her not having kids in that accident. Everyone else thought it was like some sort of disease she had. Or, oh. uh, I'm, could, I, I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing, so I could be mm. wrong. But, yeah, it was a... Yeah. And I studied Frida's life very closely, too. Frida and I have something in common. And that's why I kind of took to her um, and her story and her life. Uh, we're both born in July. We're both under the sign of cancer. So with that, I have a special kinship with Frida Kahlo. I know her um, from the inside and know how she feels and how she thinks, born under the same sign. Um, but I like that she was fearless. Frida Kahlo was fearless, you know. I think the first time I ever became aware of her was the uh, movie with uh, Salma Hayek where she played Frida. And after that, I was like, okay, who is this lady? I mean, she was just something else, amazing. And um, I, I love the story with her and Diego Rivera and the love story there. And just all that she endured. And regardless of what she went through, she persevered and expressed herself and her art. Wow, that for me was very special. So I was honored to create that statue of Frida Kahlo, which again, I haven't seen anything as good as my rendition of Frida Kahlo, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, your mother is, what's it, what do you call, mother of uh, 
humanity. Mother of humanity. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, we've only got about five minutes, though. Five oh, minutes more left, okay. if it's uh, okay. Well, we could wrap up. No, 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 tell me. Uh, ask uh, me I just wanted, to, wanted you to touch a little bit on the Mother of Humanity. It oh. seems like an incredible, yeah. incredible project. There. Yes, yes, it is. The Mother of Humanity. This project is for everybody. For everybody that I've been um, associated with or influenced by as an artist and human being up to this point. And by that I mean it's for black, white, Asian, Hispanic, every human being on the planet that's come into my experience. All of that now culminates in the mother of humanity. Um, where I live here in LA, in the building uh, back in 1992, it was full of people from many places around the world. We had Asian, European, Latino, African, Caribbean, African American. And we're all getting along pretty well. But after the riots, people who were neighbors right next door to each other kind of eyed each other with a little bit of, you know, hesitancy because the riots kind of engulfed all of L.A. As an artist, I said, I have to do something about that. I can't simply uh, create uh, a, a nice work of art or put on a softball game or a get-together to try to heal. I have to do something that uh, erased the notion that there was something called race because that word, R-A-C-E, was a manufactured word designed to put people in separate categories and divide them so they did not see their connection, their interconnectedness. So you got a black race, you got a white race, you got the yellow race, you know. People who were trying to manipulate society created this word and then put people into those categories. And that means that if you're in this category, you don't see that there's any connection with someone else in the other category. So I said to myself, okay, where did humanity come from? Did human beings pop up at the same time in different regions of the world? The answer was no. All humanity came from Africa. Really? So you mean that someone in, in uh, China might be related in some form or fashion? Yeah, that's exactly what it meant. So I came up with an idea called the mother of humanity. Because we trace our DNA through the female line, matrilineal, matrilineal DNA. Um, so it had to be a woman. And then I was faced with the challenge, okay, if you're going to make a face of a woman that represents all of humanity, how are you going to do that? So I did. The lips are African, the eyes are Asian, the nose is European. It encompasses everybody. And she's gorgeous. She's pretty. So it was a stroke of luck maybe, or divine inspiration that I found the face to create the mother of humanity. Um, she holds a, f a feather, which is a feather of peace, goes back to even the Native American tradition of honoring the feather, goes all the way back further to the ancient African or Kemetic um, tradition known as Egyptian. So it had a history, its symbolism, the dot on her forehead uh, represented the pineal gland of inner wisdom and insight. So the statue was created, and in 1996, I unveiled my largest piece up to that point, which was 16 feet tall. It's in Watts, California, at a place called WLCAC, Watts Labor Community Action Committee, at 109th and Central Avenue. That 16-foot bronze stayed there from uh, 1996, Mother's Day, May 11th, when I unveiled it. And it became the inspiration for a much larger vision, which I'm working on now, which is for Africa. The Mother of Humanity version for Africa will be 313 feet tall, which makes it twice the size of the Statue of Liberty. And for those who may be hearing it saying, ah, this nigga's crazy, he ain't gonna do that, you know, it's like, okay, well, tell me that uh, when I was in the Air Force for four years and said I was gonna get into the film industry and then end up with Jackie Chan as my first film, okay? I'm guided by forces that people can't see, and I don't see, but I trust. So if I say I'm going to make a monument 313 feet tall, that's what's given to me, and that's what I am here to do. And so last year, in February uh, 2016, uh, I was invited to Cameroon. Um, it's a country in West Africa. And uh, the Cameroon government gave me 200 acres of land. They said, 
I like your idea. We're going to give you land to build it. So uh, we have 200 acres of land. Uh, just this recently, um, May 15th of 2017, I had a delegation from Beijing, China, from the uh, company, it's the fourth largest construction company in China, and they sent a delegation of seven people here to meet me. And they said, we believe in your project. We want to be the company to construct it. So, that's it. Now, the mother of humanity is something that everybody in this country can get involved in. Because in order to build it, it's a people's project. It's not coming from the government. It's not coming from any special interest group. No religious group. This is people-powered. So uh, we're asking people to donate. For children uh, 7 to 26, we're asking um, $7. And for everybody else who wants to donate, donate. And we'll build it. So this is a people's project. And when we begin to launch, I feel that the hip hop community is going to be instrumental in spreading the word about this. And probably that's why the Tupac project is coming to me now to connect me to the wider youth community that I wasn't connected to before. If you look at it, I was connected to the film industry through Jackie Chan and the martial arts. And then I got connected to the music industry with uh, Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and Stella Cruz. I did work with Stella Cruz also. But, and then with, uh, again, the film industry, with um, the older film industry, with Shirley Temple. But now, everything was lacking because I wasn't connected with the youth. I didn't have a project um, that the youth connected with. Now, here we are with Tupac. So when the Mother of Humanity launches in a few more months, um, I'll be able to spread the word and get everybody involved. Because this is a project for all of humanity. This says, especially from the point of view of the youth, that we want a better world. We don't want the same old stuff. We want a better world, and this represents that for us. This is a symbol. Great. Thank you for taking the time. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I hope I didn't run my mouth too much, man. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. All right. I love this. All right. Recording. Um, you want to start off by just introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Nigel Bins. And uh, what is it? What, what's your profession? What is it you do? Uh, I do a multiple, um, a multitude of things. I'm a sculptor, a portrait sculptor, which is a lot different from someone who just creates images and objects. I specialize in people, uh, and I'm able to capture their essence. So I'm a sculptor at one. I'm a martial artist. I've uh, started training in 1968. A 